with us James Howard Kunstler, a uh, neighbor over the border in, in New York and a uh, famous author of many works of fiction and nonfiction. Most recently, um, or this July, so we're not quite there yet, we have The Harrow of Spring, which is uh, Mr. Kunstler's fourth book in the World Made by Hand series. So we're very happy to have you with us. Thanks for coming over. Namaste. <laughs> so, As we uh, say across the border. Right, yeah. So we have, this is your fourth and final in the World Made by Hand, right? One for yeah. each season? That was the idea behind the project. I was going to write one book for each season of the year. Right. Uh, it takes place in a uh, fictional upstate New York town just across the border uh, in Washington County and uh, takes place in a somewhat unspecified uh, future uh, in which the American economy has suffered hugely and life is now very different. You know, the electricity's off and the internet is gone and the cars are over with and uh, there's been a war in the holy land, as they call it these days, in the fictional days. And that's, that's what's going on. So you explored some of these issues in your nonfiction work. Do you find it, uh, what in, inspired you to kind of create this world in, in fiction and explore it that way? Is it? Well, a couple of things. You know, in the first place, I always wanted to be and, and continue to want to be a full service writer. You know, I don't really like being pigeonholed. Right. So um, I started a series of nonfiction books, uh, you know, af after kind of my early apprentice period of uh, writing novels in the 70s and 80s, I veered back into journalism and nonfiction. And I wrote a series of books about, you know, the fiasco of suburbia and then a bunch of books on urban planning. And, and a, lo a lot of those books kind of introduced the recognition that we were going to have uh, start having problems with uh, the American way of life and in particular the, uh, the happy motoring paradigm. And that led me into an exploration of energy issues. And that led to a book in 2005 called The Long Emergency. And The Long Emergency was a, about the series of uh, uh, challenges that we're facing in the 21st century. Energy and resource problems, problems with capital and banking, which arise from energy and resource problems. Uh, uh, disease problems, which are, we're just on the edge of, you know, epidemic disease problems with organisms that we can't defeat by the means that we've acquired in the last century. And of course, uh, climate problems. Uh, so uh, I, wrote the, I wrote that book and um, it struck a chord with people, but I wanted to continue the discussion by other means. And I decided to use fiction to do it. I had written a bunch of novels. I felt pretty confident about my ability to write fiction. And I liked doing it because unlike nonfiction, you just make stuff up. You know, the, the problem with uh, nonfiction is that you have to be correct. Right? Right. But fiction, you can just make stuff up. And um, so I wanted to get to people about what this, the, this, this plausible future in America might be if we really did run into serious uh, resource problems, energy problems, disease problems, banking problems, etc. things that would tend to crash the economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I created this uh, first book called World Made by Hand. And uh, that's how I got into that particular sandbox of literature. Right, right. And you did a great job. Well, thank you very much. I, I've enjoyed all of them and I'm enjoying uh, the most recent one now. Um, so when you're in that, it is very plausible. Like, you know, sometimes when people ask about reading, you know, post-apocalyptic type things, when this isn't really that, but it's, it gets pigeonholed in, into that category, people, uh, um, people find it 
too distant or too too implausible. But this is like normal life, but in a very different setting. So it, it, I do find it very plausible, and the characters mainly are, are what do that for me. Um, so do you, uh, when you were creating the characters, were you trying to create kind of archetypes that you wanted to explore, or was it more freeform and just kind of people you had in your head that you liked, or people you saw around town that you wanted to put into this future, or how did that work? Well, it's a combination of both, and I think that certainly some of them are archetypal. Uh, one of the things I set up at the very beginning was that uh, uh, I had a group of people, namely uh, an evangelical Christian cult that had moved into this small town in upstate New York from Dixieland. They had come up from Virginia via Pennsylvania where they sojourned for a while and were not successful because of its proximity to Philadelphia and Washington which were very troubled places in the fictional, uh, in the story. Um, so this, this group, uh, the uh, New Faith Covenant Brotherhood of Jesus, shows up in town, and, and they're led by a pretty colorful character named Brother Job, who figures very uh, strongly in all four books. And um, I, I like to think of him as a combination of Boss Hogg meets Captain Ahab. Because he's overtly comical, you know, a kind of a rotund, rotund, bustling little hustler guy. But he's also uh, powerful and dark. Uh, you know, there's a lot underneath the, the surface current with him. Right. Uh, and I created him for, and, and his group for a purpose because I wanted to describe uh, what was going on with the mentality of the people in this new paradigm, this new society that had emerged after a, a cultural and economic collapse. And the whole idea was that, you know, people would not think the same way in that future as they had in our time, with all of our assumptions about how things should be or, or really are. And uh, what I decided was that, and this is one of the strategies behind this, uh, for me was to depict a world that would that would be a post collapse world that would not be all that horrible that in fact people would benefit a lot from having lost a lot of the stuff you know mm -hmm. internet porn and all the distractions of gadgets and the the horrible consequences of living with automobiles constantly and incessantly um, the oppression of uh, living within an armature of institutional uh, 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 obligation all the time, you know, your obligation to a corporation or a bureaucracy, you know, all that's gone. And, uh, you know, that would change the way people think about everyday life. They literally no longer had the usual armature to hang their life on. You can't hang your life on your, your corporate job or the school system right. or the, even the courts of law, which, which you know, they're having a problem with. They don't, they don't exist anymore in the books. Uh, in the large sense. So, what is the mentality that you find there? Well, there, I, I decided there were two mentalities. There were, there were the defeated normal people who had been kind of defeated by the broken promises of technology and progress and really all the baggage of the Enlightenment. You know, logical positivism, uh, the idea that uh, life is always going to get better, uh, the idea that we, we if, we, if you measure enough things, you can understand them and control them, which is one of the central conceits of, of our time. And all that stuff, that, you know, that, that's what the, the normal people of my little town of Union Grove are kind of depressed and suffering from that. And these evangelicals come up, and they represent something different, which is kind of the re-enchantment of everyday life, which I think is going to be a thing that tends to happen. And it's a mixed bag. And I, myself, am not religious in the least. You know, I was raised in a religion-free household. And, I, you know, I don't practice any religious thing. But I got very interested in what would be the uh, relationship between these townspeople and this new group who had come in. Mm -hmm. And as the four books go on, you see them integrating kind of into, into each other's world. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather successfully. And also you discover that uh, everyday life in some ways has been re-enchanted. And by that I mean, 
that, uh, uh, not that it's supernatural, not that, uh, you know, the, the world is now animated by ghosts and spirits and the principalities of the air, but uh, th th that, that people have a, a much more kind of uh, uh, mystical faith in the, the purpose of being a human being in the world. You know, and it's not just supplied by, uh, you know, the news media or a gadget or an app or some extrinsic thing that is supposed to make you more human. Now they're having to be, you know, to be more human within the, the natural order that has been restored. Mm -hmm. Now that's a pretty windy answer, but... Yeah, no, but, you're, uh, you're painting the picture well. I mean, you have the people that still think that the national government is going to reform and that the electricity is going to come back and they got their head in the clouds and then you got the people who uh, have actually transformed themselves and are thriving in this new environment you know yeah exactly was an actor you know came back grew up on a farm but then went out to hollywood now he's back and he's got a you know a thriving farm and he's supplying uh, work and, and livelihood for you know dozens of families. And um, then you have the Bullock character, who's also thriving, but he's he's a little off his rocker. Um, yeah. Well, I had you know I had um, kind of a, a, a problem I had to resolve in writing the books, which is if the economy has reorganized and is now focused really on agriculture and and local. Uh, commerce around it, whatever they can come up with to support that. Um, what would the what would the disposition of things be? And you know, I came to the conclusion that at this point, you know, a, a, a couple of decades after a collapse, a lot of things were still being worked out. So you have different uh, and and the farmers in this um, uh, s set of stories, <clears throat> the farmers are tend to be the more successful and wealthier people mm -hmm. because you know they're getting their wealth out of the land now not out of uh you know investing in in equities of giant corporations or clipping coupons or you know buying derivatives or you know any of that kind of uh, uh nonsensical garbage that our current economy is based on but uh you know the, each farmer had a different way of getting to what of of, of thriving and Mr. Bullock is a rather severe character. Stephen Bullock is uh, really depicted as a, uh, a developing feudal lord. And he's keenly aware of how that's working, and he kind of resents being in that position. He doesn't really want to be, you know, a neo-feudal character, you know. But the fact of the matter is, you know, he runs a very large establishment of several thousand acres. He has invited many families and individuals and men and women to come and live on his property. He's built them a little village on his property. Uh, and they have a relationship of, you know, dependence on each other, interdependence. But he's basically the boss. And whenever he's threatened, severe things tend to happen. Yeah, indeed. Uh, one of the, the things I liked about the whole series is that uh, you had this intense local Union Grove, is the name of the town, and, yeah. and all the dynamics of these characters that you create. Um, but then you also foray out into the, the the world, as it were. I mean, there's there's a uh, some scenes with trade with Albany and Albany and up and down the Hudson. That's now far away because we don't have cars and interstates. Yeah, it's like right? a two-day journey, uh, right? And then at, at, uh, at one point, you have one of the characters traveling across the country and exploring and, and, and uh, getting involved very intensely in some of the regional governments and, and um, machinations that are going on in, in the former United States. So can you talk a little bit about the, the, the wider geography and how you yeah. played off those, the new states? I was rather parsimonious in the first two books about what had happened in the United States. And uh, largely for the reason that the characters themselves had not learned a whole lot. You know, they, they had been pretty much cut off from media and communication about, you know, what's happening. In the, so they get very little information. And so in the third book, I have a character 
who's actually mentioned through, through all the books, but in the third book he finally appears. And he's the son of one of the leading uh, characters, perhaps the protagonist, uh, a man named Robert Earl, a widow who's about 45 years old. His son Daniel has left town two years earlier to go see what happened in America with the son of the uh, uh, congregational minister, Lauren Holder. And these two companions set off on the Erie Canal. They get into a lot of trouble at the end of that journey. And they have to, uh, to flee. And they buy a boat in desperation. They buy a small boat in Buffalo, or what remains of Buffalo. And they take off on the Great Lakes. Um, things happen. And uh, Daniel uh, is shipwrecked, finds himself taken aboard a schooner, um, which is run by the remnants of the, the combined secret services of what's left of the United States government, which is now moved to uh, a small town in Michigan on an island off of Lake Huron, in, in Lake Huron. Um, he is cultivated by these people and, and developed into um, a person who can perform certain duties. And he's sent down to Tennessee where there is a, break, a breakaway country that calls itself the Foxfire Republic. It's kind of, you know, my fantasy of what a teabag republic would be in the Mid-South. And this republic is run by a former evangelical TV evangelist and country western singer, a woman uh, who I, I describe as Dolly Parton meets Hitler. Her name is Loving Morrow. And uh, uh, my character Daniel is sent down there to assassinate him. And uh, so we follow his misadventures and adventures in, all through the Midwest and down through that part of the world. And he eventually returns home. Mm -hmm. So um, you have this quartet of books, and we're excited to, to have The Harrow of Spring be published soon. Uh, what, what are you working on now and uh, that we can look forward to? Well, I'll get to that in a second, but I okay. just want to say about the Harrows of Spring that, um, you know, the, the third book in the series was called A History of the Future, and that was the book about the Foxfire Republic, right. largely. Um, the, this fourth book, The Harrows of Spring, uh, you know, well, I'm sorry, the third book, uh, the, um, the villains were basically, you know, extreme right-wing, politically uh, right-wing people. In the fourth book, the, the villains are more or less the left-wing. You know, the, the social justice warriors gone mad, right. who have come to my little town of Union Grove to basically grift the locals. And uh, am among other things, they want them to exchange all their silver for these bogus paper dollars that they're, they're proffering. And a, a kind of a scheme to reunite the governments of the, uh, the Hudson Valley and New England. Anyway, so uh, uh, I just wanted to make clear that uh, I'm politically in the center and, and uh, uh, I'm kind of an equal opportunity, opportunity uh, uh, satirist of both the left and the right, in case there's any question. <laughs> so right now, uh, I started writing a novel <clears throat> last fall uh, that is a 1967 hippie novel set on a commune outside of Bennington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And the narrator is a 19-year-old girl, and I wanted to inhabit her persona and write a book from the point of view of a 19-year-old girl to see, if, to see if I could do it. And I'm halfway through it now, and it's really going very well. Excellent. The working title is Green Mountain Real. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when I'm going to finish it, but I, I've been writing it pretty quickly, so probably not, not uh, a long job. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. Nice. Uh, so you brought up earlier The Long Emergency, and, yeah. and you wrote a book a, little, a few years ago called Too Much Magic, which was also nonfiction and uh, brought up similar themes. Um, so, are, you know, Long emergency was 2005, right? So, right. so here we are, 11 years later. Are you, 
uh, surprised? What are you surprised about that has come true or hasn't come true from those, uh, that exploration? And, and where do you see things right now? Yeah, that's in a very interesting question. Uh, I didn't call it the long emergency for nothing. You know, uh, I kind of uh, intuited that it was going to take a, a long time to unravel. <clears throat> and it would represent, you know, a kind of uncomfortable phase of history. It was really a case of which of our systems was going to get into trouble first. And by that I mean, you know, we live in a, a, a highly complex society made up of many highly complex interdependent systems. And you, you can examine them and look at them and look at the inter, interrelations, but because life, you know, is kind of uh, fractal and, and, and uncertain and um, nonlinear, uh, you're going to tend to be surprised by what's happened. So what surprised me the most was that the banking system managed to levitate on nothing more than central bank shenanigans for the last uh, eight years since... Uh, uh, 2008, and um, the uh, it, it really is quite astounding how uh, how uh, um, fraud and uh, especially bookkeeping fraud can sustain a financial system and a banking system. But that's pretty much what's happened. What what's probably more surprising, I think, to most Americans is how much the political system has unraveled and is now manifesting in an election that uh, most people probably have a hard time believing is actually working out the way it is with, you know, uh, a maniac having completely buffaloed the Republican Party, you know, a, a very kind of unstable um, kind of borderline personality uh, having taken over the Republican Party by main force, and uh, on the other side, uh, a, a Democratic candidate who almost nobody likes and trusts. And you know, this this is this is uh, what we're heading into. My own my own belief about this, speaking in you know on June first of this election year is that the conventions are going to be extremely disorderly, possibly violent, that there are any number of things which could possibly even destabilize the election itself. I wouldn't be surprised if both of the current leading candidates, Trump and Clinton, uh, did not end up being the nominees of their party. Um, I think we're seeing possibly the, the blow up of both of the traditional major parties, that at the very least they're not going to be what they, what they were a year ago and had been for generations. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a really serious uh, you know, uh, flux in the American body politic, and we don't quite know where it's going. You know, in, in my nonfiction books, for years I, I said, get ready for a corn pone Nazi. And, uh, you know, Trump is not, doesn't exactly represent the, the corn pone element necessarily, although a lot of them are attracted to him. But, um, but I think that, you know, the, we could slide into some kind of an authoritarian mm -hmm. um, situation. Because, you know, the American people have been so complacent for so long and there are so many there are so many fragilities and problems in uh, American life that could really, really uh, uh, set us back, you know, into uh, a dark age. That I think that they're going to beg somebody to push them around and tell them what to do after a certain point. So mm -hmm. that's the real danger for now is you know the political dis disintegration. Yeah, which is all connected to the the banking and the environmental and, and social disintegration that you yeah, talk and, about and in various places. 
Yeah, and basically the you know the, the loss of the standard of living that people are used to, and mm -hmm. terrible uncertainty and fear about the future. Um, ironically, oil is as cheap as it's been in in decades now, yeah. uh, and a lot of people uh, had predicted that it would be super expensive by now and, and that there would be a lot of implications for the economy and society from that point of view. Um, any comments Yeah, the oil on issue that? is completely misunderstood by the public and the media and, of course, the politicians. And you can understand it this way. There's a basic equation that oil over $75 a barrel destroys industrial economies and oil under $75 a barrel destroys oil companies. And we, you know, you, I actually predicted that we would see a tremendous oscillation in oil prices, that they, you know, they wouldn't just be high, they might also be low. And we, you know, what we're, this played out also in a nonlinear way. Um, so I think the bottom line is that people should understand the peak oil problem is not over at all. Low prices do not represent safety. You know, we're still in the wishful thinking era of the post-2008 crash period. Um, and the, ma the master wish for America is, please, God, can't we keep driving to Walmart forever? Right? Uh, we're going to be very disappointed about how that works out. And uh, it may not necessarily be reflected in high oil prices. Low oil prices can get us in as much trouble as high oil prices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have a phrase that called techno-industrial overreach. Is that basically what you're talking about here? Is what, what we're well, actually, my, th that's not quite my phrase. But uh, my the ones that I have developed and like are I like techno-narcissism, right. which is the idea that uh, you know some magic that they are going to come up with a magical rescue remedy to allow us to drive to Walmart forever. And of course, shale oil was part of that package. You know, we're now dis dis uh, discovering that when oil prices go under $75 a barrel, all the shale oil companies go broke and right. bankrupt. So we, we, we're just beginning to discover that. Um, but there's a whole other, you know, kit bag of magical rescue remedies that people are waiting for technology to solve. like. You know, the Tesla electric car is going to allow us to drive to Walmart forever. You know, not. It ain't going to happen. But, you know, we continue to wish. And um, we really haven't had a face-to-face uh, -face encounter with uh, that, that old friend of ours, reality. That, that yet awaits. Right. Well, and your, your series of books, your quartet, uh, does a good job at helping us explore a potential near future reality and it's both enjoyable as fiction and it's well written but it's also thought provoking and uh, and and fun and it's dark but it's also humorous and it being all, all four of the books so thank you for recognizing that the books are funny because the critics never notice oh they're in, indeed they're quite funny um, but that's exactly what I wanted to do by the way right. I wanted to give people kind of a bridge to understand that whatever you know, whatever the hardships of the future may be, they may be uh, also compensated for by a lot of benefits of having made that journey. Absolutely. Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Coming again. And I'm sure we'll see you many times in the future. A the pleasure. Harrows of Springs being published in July. And uh, James Howard Kunstler joining us at the Northshire Bookstore. Thanks, Chris.